Welcome back, everybody, to the Blazer Victory Podcast. John Duncan here. Of course, I'm joined, as always, with my co-host, Darian Smith. And, Darian, we've got some Friday Night Lights this Friday up in Bowling Green. Oh, yeah. We got a, a huge one coming up. So, we're going to need um, – have you ever watched Dragon Ball Z? I know. I'm a nerd. you watched Dragon Ball Z before? Yeah, it's been a long time. But, yeah, I have seen Dragon Ball Z. You remember when Goku did the spirit bomb? Like, <laughs> like oh, he, he, yeah. would ask, he would ask for everybody's energy. We're going to need, like, a big – UAB Blazer, Spirit Bomb, like everybody, we just need all the energy from everybody, all the good kudos. We just need, we need this one. So whatever we need to do to get this one, all of the good juju, it's a big one against WKU. So then we got to pull this one out Friday, man. I'm, I'm hype. I'm hype. I'm telling you, man, this right here is going to decide, are you a contender are you a pretender? Because you've got two teams both coming in two and one in Conference USA play. Um, I mean, it's, this is such a big game. Uh, Friday night, 7 p.m. Central Time, as UAB travels to Bowling Green to take on the WKU Hilltoppers. I mean, unfortunately, I was there, you know, last time UAB uh, traveled up to Bowling Green back in 2019, where uh, Tyler Johnson threw like four interceptions. So it was not the best of nine. Uh, for the UAB Blazers, um, but luckily I'm not going to be able to make it to the game this Friday, so hopefully they'll do better with without me being there. Um, but I mean, dude, I ca- I cannot, sig- you know, just tell how significant this game is. Like I-, I don't know, like both teams two and one. Like if you drop this one, you pretty much know, hey, you know, I'm I'm out of the CUSA championship race. Right. And this is a good WKU team, like. You know, you look at last year's WKU team where Bailey Zappi was just throwing the ball everywhere around. The defense wasn't great. But, I mean, really, like, WKU seems to be kind of clicking on all cylinders. Like, on the offensive side of the ball, they replaced um, Zappi with Austin Reed. He's coming over from uh, West Florida. But, I mean, he just had an awesome day today against Middle Tennessee, 32 of 49 for 278. Um yards and i'm sorry i just said today but yes we are recording this uh saturday night uh, since i will be um on our my trip and it's darian's birthday week so we are going ahead and recording this and also we had the fortune to be joined by jared mcdonald which in a couple minutes we will roll our interview with him uh so jared thank you again so much for coming on the blazer victory podcast um and guys if you are not following jared go ahead and give him a follow at jay mcdonald of sport he does a great job covering western kentucky for the bowling green daily news and he's been there for a few years now so shout out and give him a follow but and we'll, we'll try to keep our portion of the preview short because that ended up being a 35 inter- a 35 minute interview um which was great stuff but um but Definitely looking forward to kind of seeing how our Blazers look this Friday night. Um, because, you know, Darren, we were just talking on our Charlotte recap. You know Western Kentucky is going to look at that Charlotte film and just say, hey, well, if Charlotte was able to do this, well, we sure as hell be, a, you know, we'll be able to do this too. Yeah. Like, yeah, we talked in that recap and we said, you know, the way to beat us is to – you got to out UAB, UAB. Like, a lot of times yeah. it's – um. You know, people try to play that that other style, the big play style, but we do a good job of taking that away. Mm-hmm. And I think another thing that David Reeves do a good job, if you give him film, he's going to study up on it and he's going to take away whatever you do best. So you need to have a counter punch against us or or you need to just come out and show, hey, I know I usually I box traditional. Hey, I can I'm, I can box lifty. You know, I can switch it up. It's like, wait, wait, wait. And that it kind of gets us on our heels, like, you know, so if you can kind of catch us off guard or just kind of ball control us, um, I think you can do some things against us. So I'm wondering how Western Kentucky is going to play it. They seem they seem pretty balanced. Of course, they're going to throw it more than they run it, but they can run it. Yeah, you know? Robichaux can run it, yeah. Yeah, he can run it, and even even um, um quarterback Reed – he can write it sometimes too. He's not. He's not Dylan. He's not Demar Jackson. <laughs> right. But, <laughs> but, he, but he can. He can run it, man. I I do think this next evolution of Dylan Hopkins 
he's he's been involved in as the season go. I think this is going to be so important. Like it is. Is it is it is it a real thing? I think it'll show this game. Um, he's been looking pretty comfortable throwing it. He's been throwing it um, deep. He's been throwing it over the middle, screen passes. And, you know, more, more, what I like the most is how he has been pulling down. He, he's not just sitting in the pocket and taking sacks. Like, the dude, if you give solid protection nobody's open, he finds a crease and he can take off. Right. Especially he's not the most shifty guy. But if you give him a – if he got to explode through and, you know, just north-south, he can take it to the he can take it the distance, man. The dude got some un, underrated wheels on him, you know. So um, I think a lot is going to be shown about because I mean we got we know we can Debo can do. Yeah, I, I expect a hundred yards at least, and I I know what school can do with his versatility. Okay, we got that. This is Dylan. This is going to be Dylan and Brian Vincent, and this is a big one here. So if we're gonna win, we need smart decisions. We need we need the next. If we're gonna have Dylan is gonna have to have one of those games, man. I I think he's gonna have to show that he's one of the best quarterbacks in this league. I believe in him. I think Me he too. can do it. Me too. And he's gonna have to uh, take you know take care of the ball. Um, you know I just mentioned the last time UAB went up in 2019. You know quarterback at the time Tyler Johnson threw four interceptions, and of course that led to UAB's downfall and losing that game. Um, so if Dylan can, you know, do what he did today uh, or did, you know, what he did against Middle Tennessee and what he did against Charlotte, then, hey, I like our chances. Um, but the couple matchups that I'm looking forward to seeing is um, UAB's offensive line and that rushing attack with Debo against Western Kentucky's defensive line and their rush defense. That's that's going to be first for me what I'm looking forward to Friday night. And secondly, WKU's wide receivers against our secondary. I mean, the, this is a very – I feel like we say this every week. You know, Western Kentucky, like, they've really got a really good receiving core. Like, you look at Daywood Davis, Malachi Corley. Like, they've got some dudes on this team. And, you know, the quarterback, Austin Reed, just makes them look even better. Um, you know, I mean, this – he loves to spread the ball around, and it's not just one wide receiver. It's a, it's a few of them. You know, but definitely looking at those two uh, with Corley – I didn't even mention Jalen Hall. I mean, and Michael Matheson. I mean, there's some dudes on this team, and I can't wait to see how our secondary matches up against them. Yeah, I think we I think we have the best secondary in CUSA. Um, but you know, against this game, uh, this game against Charlotte, we was kind of exposed, especially up the seams. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I'm I'm wondering, you know, was that and it's that it that one. It wasn't a man to man thing. It was a look that they were given. It was some kind of zone. I'm not sure. I had to go back and look at the film. But they were able to exploit that. You know, and um, you know, but I still believe that we have the best look with Grayson Cash and um Mac D Mac and Starlin. Um, those three, bro, like Jalen Key back there, he's he been he lurks and he can get picks. So it's got it's a it's gonna be a hell of a matchup. Um, I do think their D line versus our offensive line is gonna be key because there are no slouches. There, yeah, they these guys can get physical. Like this isn't the Western Kentucky of this isn't the Bailey Zap in the in the in the rest of the guys. No, mm-hmm. Bailey Zap in the rest of the guys. These guys, these guys can get stops. You know, right. um, they're tough. They're physical up front. Linebackers come down here and they're physical. I, I, I need I need to pay attention more to that secondary. I wasn't sure, um, but I still. The more I think about this game, the more I think about Dylan Hopkins. Um, I do wonder what our defense as a whole, what the game plan will be. I'm not really sure. Um, I'm very curious to see how David Reeves attacks this team, um, but I just want to see Dylan. I want to see Dylan play like he did against BYU. Yes. You know, I want to see that Dylan coming on onto the second half of this year. We're going to need that guy because we just had a game in Charlotte that we wanted to dominate, but we really we saw we still saw a couple mental blunders. Again, I'm proud of the penalties though. We only had two, mm-hmm. but that you know we had the snap and we had a couple. Just seemed like we went 
on the on the same page. But I would say this: in the past, we lose a game like that. Yeah. In the past, we lose a game like that, but we were able to make winning plays when it mattered, and we got through and we won. So it's it's different ways you can look at it, but I, be, I believe this is going to go come down to Dylan and the decisions that he make. Is he going to be on time with the ball? Is he going to be on target? Is, is uh, balls going to sell on him or not? Or we'll see, man. But I think <laughs> I think him and Trey and and Tajon Palmer and Fred Ferry and all those guys, I think they can make enough plays, and I think we can pull it out, man. Yeah, I, I agree. And I'll go ahead and give my official prediction. I've got it UAB 24, WKU 21. So I think it'll be close, but I think UAB pulls it out somehow. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I got it. I got it 27 24, UAB. Nice. Nice. So, well, hey, we'll take we'll, it. Hey, if we win by one point, we'll take it. <laughs> Get yeah, out I, there with the win. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care if we win by 0.5. You know, as long as we win, <laughs> we win man. Right. Uh, well, guys, um, reminder, there will not be a instant reaction show, uh, a recap for this WKU game. We'll just uh, kind of loop it in with our FAU preview next week. Um, but right now, we'll go ahead and roll our awesome interview that we had with Jared McDonald. Jared, thanks again for coming on. And without further ado, we'll go ahead and roll our interview. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the Blazer Victory podcast, where we are pleased to be joined by Returning guest, Jared McDonald uh, of the Bowling Green Daily News. Jared, you know, for those that are day ones, back in 2020, you came on the Blazer Victory podcast and did such a phenomenal job, um, you know, letting us know about Western that, hey, you know, you're, you're a good friend of mine. I know you know your stuff, especially when it comes to Western Kentucky. But welcome back to the Blazer Victory podcast, Jared. How are you doing? I'm not bad. It feels good to be back. You say 2020. I can't believe it's already been that long. It's been two full seasons pretty much. So I'm telling you, it's so wild to, you know, that we haven't played Western since 2020. Um, seems like it was just yesterday. Um, but right. guys, if you are not following Jared on Twitter, go ahead and give him a follow at J McDonald sport. You know, like I mentioned, he does a great job covering Western Kentucky um, and other things in uh, for the Bowling Green Daily News. Um, so definitely recommend you guys giving him a follow. Um, and I do want to state on the record that we are recording this interview with Jared on October the 10th. So this week, Western Kentucky has a really big uh, rivalry game um, against Middle Tennessee State. Uh, I believe they call hmm. it the 100 Miles of Hate. Jared, is that correct? That is correct. Awesome. Yeah. So just up by 65, um, those two teams will meet this Saturday. Now you are listening to this episode well after the fact. So we will not ask you, you know, any <laughs> predictions about the middle <laughs> Tennessee game. Um, but we do, <laughs> you know, we, we've got a lot of questions for him about this Western Kentucky team. So heading into this game, Western Kentucky is three and three, one and one in conference USA play. Jared, I, I'm going to be real with you. I was one of those persons that, really just thought WKU was going to take a big step back this year. You know, after losing Bailey Zappi, you know, to the NFL, to the New England Patriots and a couple other weapons. Um, But obviously, I mean, they, they've looked really good so far this year. Um, You know, really taking UTSA to the wire um, this past Saturday. But my question to you, Jared, is why haven't they taken a big step back? Is, is, is Helton just the portal king and he just knows, you know, to reload – year in and year out or what what exactly is going on to um because i know i wasn't the only one to you know predict wku to have such a drop off yeah no the portal definitely has helped them out quite a bit you know i guess starting at the the quarterback position tyson helton always talks about how important it is to have that trigger man back there uh you know especially in the style of offense that they want to play back two years ago when we talked they had terrell pigram at quarterback wasn't a strong passer, so we didn't really fit the mold of what they were trying to do. Uh, I believe, actually, Kibaris Thomas started that game down in Birmingham that year, his first start ever at Legion Field. Uh, you know, wasn't a very good showing. He's not with the program anymore. Piggy's not with the program anymore. And then, obviously, they do what they did last year with Bailey Zappi, who, you know, statistically had the best season ever for a quarterback in college football. So, it, I guess... It is kind of a step back in that regard, but Austin Reed came in from Division II West Florida, and he's been lighting it up. He's, you know, through six games, thrown for over 2,000 yards, 19 touchdowns. 
uh, completing over 70% of his passes. So he fits that mold that they want to try to bring in. Uh, you know, during the offseason, there was a little bit of competition there because they also brought in Jarrett Dagey from West Virginia mm -hmm. to battle it out through summer and start a fall camp. And Austin Reed was named the starter. Um, you know, they, they were pretty close in competition, I believe, but I think Reed kind of fit that mold of what they were trying to do, kind of more like Zappy than Dagey was. And, you know, Reed still has another year of eligibility after this one as well. And then you go to a position like receiver, who's, you know, an important part of this style of offense. They obviously lose Jarrett Stearns, who led the nation in receiving last year, as well as Mitchell Tinsley, who transferred to Penn State. But they still had some other guys in that room, like Daywood Davis and Malachi Corley, who were able to, you know, step up into a larger role this year, as, as well as Dalvin Smith. Uh, you know, guys like Joey Belgian, who had to step in last year at tight end for an injured uh, Josh Simon, who's now back and healthy this year. And then they also went in the portal and caught a couple of guys like Michael Matheson and Jalen Hall, who played in the MAC the last few years and who have really stepped in and done a nice job for them. You know, that running back room doesn't get a lot of love, but they're they're really having more of a balanced offense this year, especially when they're not, you know, trying to play catch up a little bit like they've had to do against UTSA and against Troy in those two losses. Uh, but Kai Robichaux has kind of emerged as that, you know, kind of every down back for them. They also have Davion Urban Poindexter, an Indiana transfer, and Jakari Moses, who has been at Western for, it feels like ever now. But Kai Robichaux has really kind of stepped up and become that guy for them. And, you know, they had some questions along the offensive line. They lost three three starters. They brought back left guard and uh, Quintavious Leslie. Uh, they call him Tick. And Rusty Stats, the center, brought in uh, right guard, Benny Murphy from South Carolina, and then had a couple other guys and Mark Good and Gunnar Britton, who are playing at the tackle spots. Um, you know, I don't know if you were watching the end of the UTSA game, but Mark Good went down with an injury, had to be carted off. Uh, they don't I have an update the... on him yet. Yeah, they don't have an update on him yet, so... Even if he is able to come back, you know, you don't imagine him to be 100% able to go all the way um, just after watching a guy get carted off like that. So they might be shuffling around a little bit there. Uh, like you said, we're recording this before the Middle Tennessee game, so that's kind of TBD at this point. Right. But, you know, really, that's been the biggest thing for them. And last year, their defense, you know, it, it struggled a little bit at times. Not as much in Conference USA play, but, um, you know, it showed up against UTSA at least, um, and then in the non-conference schedule last year. But it's really kind of shored up a little bit under Tyson Summers. They've done a nice job this year, forcing turnovers, getting pressure on the quarterback, getting him off his spot. And, you know, that's really complimented the offense well. Right. And I, speaking of that defense, Jared, you know, I, I know you spoke with uh, Summers today. Um, what The numbers don't look great for that defense, but I've – I mean, I've been impressed watching them, especially, as you just mentioned, against Frank Harris and that offense for UTSA, like, especially the secondary. I thought they did a fantastic job, um, you know, covering those receivers when they could, when, when they were able to. Um, but can you give UAB fans just a couple of guys uh, to kind of watch out for uh, this Friday night in that matchup? Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, the numbers aren't really great for them. Um, you know, except for the scoring defense part of it. it right. You know, much improved from last year, but they still give up, you know, quite a few yards. But like I said, they do a good job of turning people over, getting to the quarterback and making those big plays. You know, they wanted to play an aggressive style of defense. And, you know, I guess that starts up front. Um, you know, with the three guys up front, I'd say Roderick Martin. His stats aren't sexy, but, you know, he gets, he gets through there. He gets pressure on the quarterback a lot. I remember talking to Caleb Oliver, one of their safeties, after their Hawaii game, and he, I asked about Broderick Martin. He said there are star players and there are star makers, and he called Broderick Martin a star maker because he makes everybody else look good with what he does. Mm. You, you get a guy like Khalif Lacey in the secondary, um, you know, playing that corner position, and he's he's been much improved this year as well. And then you get some um, guys back at linebacker, Jaden Hunter, Will Ignant, both Power 5 transfers who have been at Western for a few years now. They brought in another Power 5 transfer from Illinois at linebacker and Derek Smith, who's really played extremely well for them this year. Um, and then you get another guy in Jaquez Evans who might be a name to watch. They call him Donut. <laughs> and, you know, he's been playing linebacker for them, and he's really stepped up into a nice role. Um, you know, he didn't really get a chance to shine as much with D'Angelo Malone there, who's now in the NFL with the Falcons. But he, he's really stepped into that role and done a nice job. So, um 
Jared, I'm just looking at the schedule, and of course, it's always context when you watch film. But, um, you know, you have two NL programs that you guys completely dominated in Hawaii and FIU. And you have another probably soft game in Austin Pay that was kind of closer than, you know, a little closer than the other ones. But then you have the other highly contested games with UTSA and Troy and Indiana, all of them highly contested all the way down to the wire, but all losses. So my question would be, like, what is kind of like the identity of this team? Do you think this team is real contenders, or do you think it's one piece away or maybe still improving to get to that point? You know, I still think they need to prove a little bit what they are. They look like they're good, but they haven't really been able to win that big game this year. Like you said, the three wins that they have aren't necessarily – you know, great wins at this point. Austin P is honestly probably the best win on their schedule. They went on to win, I believe, four straight games after that before losing to Central Arkansas. They've, they've shown that they can play with these good teams. You know, Indiana's a Power 5 team. Obviously, they're not at the top of the Big Ten. Troy's a solid program. First year under John Summerall. Uh, I think it's still a little bit, you know, TBD trying to prove themselves there. Uh, but I, I think they will be, you know, at the end of the year, one of the better teams in the Sun Belt. And then UTSA, they've battled with three times within the last calendar year, and they still haven't been able to come out on top of them. So I, I think they still have to prove that they can win that close game. They haven't really done that the last couple of years. Um, I mean, you look at the wins that they had last year, and most of those were blowouts, and then you look at the losses. I believe both UTSA games ended up being one-possession games when all was said and done. The championship game, they were chasing points the whole time regular season meeting, you know, kind of chasing points, but really had a great opportunity to win it at the end. Uh, weren't able to do that. Indiana game was close last year. Army game, they were chasing points early, but it ended up being a three-point game. So, you know, the last couple of years, they've been able to blow out the teams that they've beaten, but struggled a little bit in those close games, like I said. And, you know, against a team like UAB, who is so good defensively, and, you know, has a good offense, that good running game, might limit Western's possessions a little bit. I think that's going to be a big test to see how they can, you know, fare in a game like that. And, and, and speaking of the, you know, UAB trying to ground a pound against WKU, Jared, I, looks like Western Kentucky has done a really good job defending the run so far this year. You know, they're, at least in, you know, today, looking at the stats, they give up right around 100-ish uh, yards per game. I mean, so – do you think that might be one of the battles to watch for this Friday night? Um, you know, the UAB rush offense against that WKU rush defense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's That's been a big point of emphasis for them early this year. You know, with Tyson Summers as the new defensive coordinator, that's something Tyson Helton has said for years. It starts with stopping the run. Uh, and like you said, they've done a nice job with it so far, or at least a good enough job with it. I Like you said, I talked to Tyson Summers earlier today, and he was talking about Broderick Martin, who I brought up earlier, and he says he stops by his office every single day about you know, 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, and he was happy because most guys in Broderick Martin's position would be talking about you know, getting pressure on the quarterback, forcing a fumble, getting a sack, stuff like that. And he says that Broderick Martin comes in, he's like, Coach, we're going to stop the run this week. We're going to stop the run this week. And you know, he just loves that about him. So that's been a much improved part of the defense, you know, a big part of some of their success on that side of the ball. But this is going to probably be the biggest test that they face, you know, at least up to this point and probably all season. Definitely. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Darian. Yeah, next time you talk to Tyson, tell him Darian Pee Wee Smith said, hey, <laughs> he was a safety coach. He was a safeties coach over there at UAB when we all was there. We used to whoop their butt in practice, let them know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so what is, what are, what is some – intangible things that you're looking for because you obviously have great insight on the team. So one thing that we look for in UAB is um, we look for how can we limit our penalties and how smart are we playing. That oftentimes determines if we win the game or not, if we control our emotions and if we show leadership. What is something intangible wise you think that Western Kentucky needs to do in order for them to win? Yeah, no, I know you guys talk about that. I was I listened to the Blazer Victory podcast. I heard the uh, Post Rice <laughs> episode. Uh, oh. but, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I'd say it's that same kind of thing. You know, a lot of times when this offense isn't putting up points, it's because they're shooting themselves in the foot a little bit. Uh, they had a number of false starts, you know, procedural penalties in that game at UTSA. That's a tough place to play. I was down on the field. There were only like 22,000 at that game. but It gets loud in the, the Alamo Dome. Dome. Yeah. Man, it's loud in there. So it's tough, but, you know, you got to be able to play against those types of conditions. I think that's a big thing. Um, you know, another intangible thing I look at is, you know, a guy like Austin Reed, he just – you talk to him and you can tell that he's a natural leader. He wants to win. When they lose, he puts all the blame on his shoulders, you know, even if it's not his fault. In a big game like this where, you know, it could determine at the end of the day or be a big factor in who's going to the Conference USA Championship game, I look to see what he's able to do. You know, he's stepped up and, you know, moving up a division, stepped up so far. I'll be interested to see what he's able to do and, you know, some of these other leaders. Definitely. Now, uh, Jared, just, you know, looking at the offense from Western last year with Bailey Zappi, like how stylistically are they different this year compared to what they, because it seems like, you know, they still throw it around a lot with Austin Reed, but I mean, is it any different or what what would you say? I'd say there's more balance in the offense. Mm -hmm. I did a, a story, I think it was ahead of Troy after the Indiana game. And I, I took a look at the offense because it seemed like they were running the ball more. At Indiana, they rushed for over 200 yards, which I believe they had only done two or three times in the previous you know, two or three seasons. Um, they also rushed for over 200, uh, I believe, one other game this year. Uh, that would have been FIU. And I looked at the offense, and you know, last year, I believe, at that point, they had only rushed you know, about – 32 or 33 percent of the offensive plays that they had run whereas this year it was you know closer to that 46 47 percent of the plays were running plays these last couple of games for them you know troy utsa they've had to you know play a little bit of catch up so austin Reed has thrown the ball you know significantly more in those games but mm-hmm. it, you know if it's they're able to keep it a close game against uab i think it'll be more of a balanced attack uh, but if they're chasing points, it, it's going to be the Austin Reed show. They're going to throw it around, probably try to go for it on some fourth and long situations, uh, depending on field position, obviously. But, yeah, I'd say it, the, the biggest thing is it's a little bit more balance between that passing and running. Okay. Um, stylistically, um, we have faced different type of quarterbacks. We, um, we, we faced um, Salter at Liberty. It was a dual threat. Um, we face uh, Van Trees at Georgia Southern, who likes to get the ball downfield. And um, I can't think of the quarterback um, for Middle Tennessee right now. But Cunningham. He, Cunningham, he, he, he would hook it up. They were a big play offense, but the, the quarterback at Rice, they were methodical. They like to hook up over the middle for their seven-yard gains. Stylistically, what type of passing attack are we looking at uh, with WKU and Austin Reed? You know, I think they mix it up a little bit. You know, they throw some shorter passes and let some of these athletes, you know, go make plays. Daywood Davis, I think he was on that freaks list at the beginning of the season. He's ridiculously fast. Guys like Malachi Corley, he's been able to break a bunch of tackles. He had one in the, I think it was their first score against FIU. Broke three or four tackles, split a couple defenders, made it to the end zone. But, you know, they're going to take their shots if they're there. Uh, Daywood Davis is a big, big play threat. Malachi Corley's shown to make some of those plays. Jalen Hall's made some very athletic plays, too. Um, then you get a guy like Michael Matheson, who I don't know how much you watched Western last year with Jarrett Stearns, but, you know, it seems like if they need a, a first down, he's a guy that they can go to and get some of those, like, mid-range types of, types of plays. But, you know, they'll mix it up. In terms of Austin Reed being a, a mobile guy, he's probably a little bit more of a physical runner. Than Bailey Zappi was against UTSA. He ran it, I believe, 11 times more than he had all season up to that point. He's a guy that's willing to do whatever it takes to win a game. In that regard, I don't know if you remember Ty Story at Western Kentucky a few years ago. Um, he reminds me of that. He's he's a much better passer than Ty Story was, but it's that same kind of mentality in my mind where it's you know, going to do whatever it takes to win, just kind of that gamer mind. You know, I think that's what. Austin Reed brings to the table, and that's probably what he's going to need to bring to the table Friday night to UAB. 
Yeah, and see that, you know, we talked about earlier how, you know, UAB's rushing attack with Debo and Skull, you know, against that rush defense for WKU. But I think the second most important thing to watch for this Friday night is going to be those WKU wide receivers against UAB secondary. I mean, you know, it's it's obvious that's the strength of the Western Kentucky offense is getting it to those playmakers like you just mentioned earlier with Daywood Davis. Uh, whether it's Corley or Matheson, you know, or Jalen Hall too. Um, you, WKU has a lot of weapons uh, to for Austin Reed to spread the ball around. So I'm definitely looking forward to see, you know, kind of what defensive coordinator Reeves, you know, for UAB, what he's going to do. Is he going to just play man coverage, or is he going to mix it up with maybe go some zone? Or um, definitely looking forward to that matchup as well. Um, but Jared, I, so I know you. <laughs> You know, you went to Conference USA Media Days and, you know, before this this ever revolving door of realignment, um, I, we noticed a lot of WKU fans were upset uh, right when it happened. Uh, but but in your opinion, like from what you get from your readers and from what you see on social media, do you what 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 exactly are Western Kentucky fans saying about uh, this new look Conference USA um, heading into next year? Um uh, me personally, you know, I, I do think, you know, it's a great chance for Western Kentucky to continue to compete for conference. I mean, they were just in the Conference USA Championship last year and have won several um, in Conference USA. And, you know, you, you look at uh, Judy McLeod uh, possibly adding Kennesaw State. I mean, they, wouldn't you think these are teams that Western should c- compete with automatically? I mean, they're already competing with Middle Tennessee and UTEP and schools like that. Yeah, I don't think some of the fans i'm trying to figure out the best way to word this uh without making some people mad oh yeah be careful <laughs> you know i don't think some people realize what western kentucky is and how good that the fan base has it mm-hmm. you know, western kentucky bowling green is not a big town it's not a big city it's outside of bowling green is even smaller things it's very rural outside of bowling green it's not a big media market Western Kentucky has one of the smallest athletic budgets. And despite that, in nearly all sports, uh, take out baseball, take out some of the Olympic sports, they've been very competitive. And I don't think some people, and that's in a good conference. You know, mm-hmm. People don't realize that there are some good programs in Conference USA right now. There's going to be some good programs in Conference USA moving forward, too. But you know, they've got great opportunities to go win championships. This year. But, you know, obviously, a team like Liberty coming in, most sports is going to be very good. Middle Tennessee is usually competitive at least. So I think there's a great opportunity to be successful there in that regard. And then when people talk about CUSA, they talk about the TV, how the TV mm-hmm. deal is off. They can't find the channels to watch the games. But that's a TV deal that's... <laughs> You know, expected in these next couple of weeks to, you know, have a new deal in place. It's probably going to, there's a good chance it brings in more money for the schools. It's a good chance they fix some of these issues that people have had with it in terms of, you know, compacting the deal. So it's, you know, not Stadium and CBS and ESPN Plus and Facebook and all these things. Because they've been listening to, you know, what people have been saying and trying to get more exposure for that. You know, they might do some unconventional things. But it, it doesn't mean it's going to be bad. Right. There were a lot of people at Western Kentucky that were mad they didn't go to the MAC. They're talking about the TV exposure and the ESPN deal and all that. But the way I look at it is, you know, these teams in the MAC, they've been together since, what, 98? Yeah, a long how, how, time. Yeah. How much do you care about Toledo and Akron? <laughs> No. And then look, like you you were going to be playing these Tuesday night and Wednesday night games week in and week out. Like, do you really think the people at Bowling Green are going to like doing that? Like, I just I just don't I, I, I never understood the whole Mac thing. And, and I and I get, you know, they had the where Middle Tennessee was going to be a package deal with Western to be able to move together. And then all of a sudden there were some hard feelings because Middle backed out, supposedly. And I don't know. I, I think. And, and Jared, you know, you and I, we've talked plenty of times like I at the end of the day, it's a group of five conference. And honestly, you know, hey, maybe, you know, obviously the AAC and Sunbelt are near the top of the G5. 
But I do think that Conference USA, with all these teams exiting and bringing in these new faces, I mean, they might be able to, you know, make it work out in their in, in their favor. I mean, you've already looked at media days, and I've heard um, from <laughs> multiple media people that that media days, wet, regardless, you know, it was at a baseball stadium, but that it was actually pretty good this year, you know. Yeah. So hey, maybe they're getting it together. Yeah. No, I think people should keep their minds open, you know, for all those things. Never know. They might end up playing midweek games um, with this new TV deal that's going to be in place, and possibly one team who keeps whatever it is being added down the line. You know, it won't be for this upcoming year at all. But yeah, like you said, it, the people in the Sun Belt were clowning on CUSA's media day, but you know, we got to talk to the commissioner. We got to talk to the coaches, the players, both. You know, on the podium, we could talk to them individually, walk around the concourse, and you know, that's. It was a baseball stadium. It was a little weird, but it worked out well. And it was cool to be there because it's a brand new stadium. It's a great venue. You know, I got to talk to Judy McLeod one on one for half an hour or so. I wrote a story about it. Ooh. So, really good story, yeah. by the way. Yeah, really good yeah, story. Thank you. There, are, there are benefits and you know downfalls to all of it, but at the end of the day, I don't necessarily think it's going to be a bad thing. You know, everybody wants to say like, why didn't Western go back to the Sun Belt? Why didn't they do that. But you look back to 2012, 2013, everybody wanted out of the Sun Belt. It made sense at the time. Yeah. 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 And then you look at what the Sun Belt has become because of what they did. You look at the successful programs there. You look at a coastal Carolina who didn't start playing football until, you know, the later half of the 2010s. Um, Troy's been a mainstay. They had, it's just some of these schools, Georgia Southern, Georgia State, App State, you know, they weren't an FBS program before that. Right. So, it, you know, you never know what could happen. Sam Houston's had a lot of success in FCS, Jacksonville State. They've got a big name coach in Rich Rodriguez down there. Jerry Kill at New Mexico struggling, but he's been known to turn some programs around. And then obviously Liberty has been very good the last few years. Hugh Breeze's coach, some of these big name coaches. Right. And I, I kind of find it ironic, too, that you mentioned, you know, like a Sun Belt fan giving, you know, grief to Conference USA. I mean, you look a couple of years ago where Conference USA had a deal in place with the NFL Network, and that was made fun of. But lo <laughs> behold, this year, now the Sun Belt's playing on the NFL Network, and all of a sudden it's the best thing since sliced bread. Like, I just, I just don't understand it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, people are always hyping up these nationally televised games on, like, CBS Sportsnet, which it's mm -hmm. not bad, but – a lot of people don't have CBS Sportsnet, or it's hard to find. You know, as exactly. opposed to ESPN Plus, where you can get one subscription and get all these games. Right. So it, you know, it is what it is at the end of the day, and as long as you're able to watch your team, you know, that's a good thing. Exactly. You, you look back ten years ago, how many games did you not get to watch on TV or streamed online? And that's oh my goodness, yeah, it was radio pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember those days. I'm I'm still pretty young, but. Hey, we were. I remember the days of CUSA TV having to stream the video board from the from the football game. So I will not uh, make fun of uh, ESPN Plus, you know, or ever because I'm able to watch the game. And most of the time, man, th those are really good broadcasts. Now it varies on. I mean, if you're watching a game at FIU, it's probably not the best quality. But I mean, hey, for the most part, it is. You know, really good. It's really good broadcast. Um, but, but Jared, I do want to say, you know, the UAB and Western Kentucky, they've had many good games over the year, especially in basketball, but in football as well. Um, I, I definitely, you know, barring us UAB meeting Western again in the conference USA championship this year, it seems that this is going to be the last time as conference mates, at least for now, um, playing, but I, I certainly hope that, you know, that they're able to work out like a non-conference, uh, you know, multi multi-year uh, games against one another because I mean it's it's always entertaining and not you know especially in basketball you know we've had the Mars <laughs> rivalry game you know it's go going down to the wire last year in Bowling Green and you know in Conference USA tournaments it's always a good game when UAB and Western Kentucky play each other no matter what sport so I definitely hope that both of these programs will work something out to where we can keep playing Western Kentucky um, in the future. Because, hey, it's only, what, like a three-hour drive? Like, it's very doable for both fan bases uh, to to make, to make go to the opposing teams, uh, go to go to that game. So I definitely hope they can work something out in the future. Yeah, no, I agree entirely. And I think that's going to be a little bit in Mark Ingram's hands. 
Yes. I've talked to, to Todd Stewart before, and he's very interested in playing UAB. He thinks it's a game that makes a lot of sense. It um, does. Geographically, and you know, with the quality of programs that they each put on the field each year, um, you know, both in football and basketball, and I, I think most of the other sports, the non-revenue sports, look at a, a softball. They met in the title game a few years ago in CUSA here in Bowling Green. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that ends up happening in the future. Um, for football, it won't be before 2025, because I believe Western has filled out the non-conference schedule. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Basketball, I definitely think it makes sense. What Andy, Andy Kennedy has done there, you know, he's utilized that portal really well, put some really good teams on the floor. Rick Stansbury started to do that. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if these two teams on the basketball court are playing in the championship. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt. Yeah, I, I could definitely see them. Uh, meeting in the championship game uh, with the tournament bid on the line um, for for guys uh, for for our listeners that are, uh, are listening in right now that don't know Bryant Vincent is actually from around the Bowling Green area he's actually from Glasgow am I pronouncing that right Jared I know I asked you before we started recording yeah yeah you've got it <laughs> okay well Jared did a great article um, before the season uh, where he, he he got to you know talk with Vincent um, and you know, Coach Vincent said that he was excited, uh, you know, of course, for, you know, being the interim coach and, you know, leading this UAB team. Um, but definitely, guys, if you hadn't read that, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, it you know, again, Jared does a great job writing for the Bowling Green Daily News. Um, but so I'm sure he will have an article or a couple articles out uh, this week when you're listening to this podcast. So definitely go check out his work and give give him a follow on Twitter it's Jay McDonald Sport. Now, Jared, I can't let you get out of here without mentioning that you and Tyler Dixon co-host one of my favorite podcasts. It is called Meet the Press. Now, guys, that is spelled M-E-A-T, the press, Meet the Press, <laughs> where these, you know, Tyler and Jared, you know, they, I listen to it every week. I don't miss an episode, um, but, you know, they talk sports, barbecue, pretty much any. It, I, I, anything is on the table with these two guys, um, but I, I really do enjoy each and every week listening to you guys. Um, but if you guys have not checked that podcast out, definitely go. You know, I listen to them on Apple Podcasts, but they're on Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, wherever podcast, you know, wherever you listen to the Blazer Victory podcast right now, I'm sure they are on that platform. So, again, that's Meet the Press with uh, Jared McDonald and Tyler Dix, and you guys do a great job, and I, I really do look forward to it each week. Um, I do have one thing, though. My goal in life is to be the prize pig of the week. So I need to ask you, can you make that happen one day? I'm sure I can make that happen. <laughs> you know, I, I love Birmingham. You know, I love the podcast, so I'm sure that'll happen. You know, yes. I'm, yeah. No, I'm I'm excited for this game this week. I'm hopefully getting back down to Birmingham again soon. Yes, well, you'll have to come visit if you come in. Hey, if you come in January for the when the basketball teams meet up, let me know. We'll we'll hit it up, okay? Yeah, we'll have to hit up Saws or Dreamland or something, man. Yes, and go to brewery or something, man. Um, but oh, I left one thing out, man. I'm I'm keeping you over it's about 32 minutes now. But I hear from I, I saw on Twitter where Shaquille O'Neal is going to be at the game Friday night. Is that correct? Oh. Yeah, I was going to bring that up uh, before we got <laughs> off this thing. I wasn't going to let you go without talking about DJ Diesel. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, the last home game Western had, they were throughout the whole game, they were teasing this special announcement at halftime, special announcement at halftime. And, you know, they went over some friends and family stuff, the family of the year or whatever. And I was like, okay, maybe that's the announcement. Then all of a sudden this video starts playing on the video board. And it's like concerts and you know, mosh pits or whatever. And, you know, all of a sudden, it's like DJ Diesel coming to Western Kentucky. And I, I was nice. confused because I'm out of touch. I was like, who's DJ Diesel? <laughs> Shaquille O'Neal coming. And I was like, why is DJ Diesel and who, why does Shaquille O'Neal care about DJ Diesel? And come to find out, DJ Diesel is Shaquille O'Neal's stage name for uh, uh, you know his performances. Oh. So Shaquille O'Neal will be there before the game performing as DJ Diesel. Uh, he'll be playing for about an hour. It was supposed to be last year but because of covid the concert ended up getting canceled so that's uh, another exciting twist i also hear usa commissioner might be making it. oh do you think you'll get another uh one-on-one -on -one with judy uh, i'm not counting on it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man well guys uh thanks again for listening jared thank you for coming on the show again you know you are always welcome on this podcast 
man, I think, Darren, this is the longest interview we've had yet, running on, what, 34 minutes. So I, I know I told you it'd be 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> I guess I lied, uh, but thank you. So, you know, this is such great content, Jared. You know, you do a great job, um, you know, with the Bowling Green Daily News. Um, so just keep up the great work, and hopefully we can hit it up in January. I'm sad I'm not going to be able to make it to Bowling Green this Friday night. Um, I will be somewhere else. Um, so I will not be able to make it to Bowling Green. Um, but definitely, man, we, we, we got to link up sometime. Hey, man, that's for sure. I, I don't listen to many podcasts, but I do subscribe to the Blazer Victory Pod. Um, you know, listen to pretty much all of them that come out. So anytime I get a chance to be on here, I'll be happy to talk as long as you guys want to talk. Darren, we got to get <laughs> you know, this man. We got we to get him a hoodie, man. We got to get him a hoodie. Oh, yeah, most definitely. <laughs> oh, you know what's so funny about, about this episode, about this interview is that um, – you know, when you're a little kid, you know, when when your dad and the and the uncle, you know, they get together and you like kinda like just you like, yeah, it was gonna it's gonna be ten minutes of wait, wait, son. <laughs> like okay. I felt the familiarity vibes going. I said, Oh man, they're gonna be cooking for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was cooking, so it was pretty cool to witness. Yeah, man. I mean we had that too beforehand. We were talking about some of your old teammates that uh I've gotten to know over the years. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. You guys were definitely, uh, you, 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 I felt the vibes. I felt the connection there, right there. And you guys were going, I say, yeah, I need to sit back real quick and let them cook and let them talk. <laughs> oh man. Well, Darren, you want to close? Oh, well, listeners, we will not have a recap episode for the Western Kentucky game, but we'll, we'll hit on it when we do our FAU preview. Um, but Darren, you want to go ahead and wrap us up? Hey, Blazer Nation, let's ride.